Welcome back to The Exemplist. Today, we are talking about women's basketball, the NFL draft, how it all comes together, and a little bit of the Kendrick and J. Cole beef and the most disgraceful apology that I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, we're going to be joined by ESPN's Dominic Foxworth, and we'll be right back in a second. Welcome to The Exemplist, part of the Zero Blaze podcast family. I'm your host, Charles McDonald. We are you know, about two and a half weeks away from the NFL draft. Thank God this part of the year is way too long. There's way too much downtime between free agency and the draft. And it provides a lot of time for people to overthink and say some things they might regret. But uh, we'll get to that in a second. I'm joined by uh, Dominic Spockhurst from ESPN. Uh, and Dominique, how are you handling this part of the the content calendar in yeah. you know early April when there's not a damn thing going on, but we still got to talk about stuff? Yeah, I mean, we there's not a lot happening football wise. Football and there's wise, a lot of football wise, projections yeah. and a lot of uh, like hypotheticals or and who's got the most pressure. So that's a lot of that conversation, but. My podcast is not confined only to football, so you know what we do? We talk about something else. (laughs) 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 Talk about some other stuff. We talk about Caitlin Clark. We talk about a little bit of uh, UConn and and some NBA stuff. Yeah, I kind of wanted to talk about some of the other stuff because, I don't know, there's there's just not enough NFL stuff right now for us to fill all this and have it be interesting. Caitlin Clark's dominant run in the NCAA came to a close by the hand of a team that, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, dude, you look back at the, all the Caitlin Clark stuff and like, wow, there's a team that went 38 and no. And it's like the deepest team in college basketball. And they seem like they have two legitimate starting fives that they can put out there at any point uh, and just kind of steamroll people. But I think the conversation around her, like, just being the goats or how wrapped up people have gotten in her being the goat or her not being the goat because she may, or cause she doesn't have a championship. Like how I, I, just, I don't understand how, how the conversation just accelerated on her so fast where people are taking like legit stances and sides. And it feels like there's like boundaries being drawn and teams being drawn over whether or not yeah. Kaylin Clark is the goat and how we got here. We're trying to fit this square peg of uh, women's college basketball into the round hole of sports conversation, and we only got a couple moves. <laughs> we go, we go to plot them same moves, no matter what the conversation is, and it's made worse by the fact that we only know one person. Like by and large, <laughs> we all know the name of one person, uh, and we know a couple moves, and that's how it's going to get to the place that it's gotten so fast, and you get emotional tied to these things I, I honestly think that i don't know the older i get the more i realize i was stupid before but at this point in my life i'm starting to appreciate how a lot of our comments say more about us than they do about what we're actually commenting on you know and like you can gen up some emotion and i've done this on first take before cared a lot or look like I cared a lot more about what I was talking about <laughs> than what I was talking about, but don't let somebody challenge me all day. <laughs> then all of a sudden I am locked all Then I really believe it even more because it's like, it's not even the point that you're challenging. It's me that you're challenging. It's my intelligence. It's like uh, my analysis, what I know. And so I think that happens so fast. Don't nobody give a shit about Kaylin Clark like this. Like I'm sure some people do who went to Iowa, her parents do, but all of us who just showed up, like, let's be honest. I watched a good amount of college women's college basketball during a tournament last year. And I actually watched some regular season games this year. Caitlin Clark and a lot of South Carolina because I love Malaysia for Wiley. She's ridiculous. Yes. Uh, and no, those sorts of things. But I don't really know what's happening and neither do y'all. <laughs> so stop acting like you care that much about this stuff. Well, I feel like when you don't know what's happening in general, it just like things become like proxy wars, you know, like I think the like the Caleb Williams and the, the fingernail paint stuff. Is, oh, yeah. It's a big example of that. It's like, man, you don't care about Caleb Williams painting his fingernails. Like, like when you when you swipe away from that tweet, like, are you still thinking like 20 minutes later? Damn. Boy, really be painting his fingernails, man. Like, what 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 are we talking about? And I sometimes I feel like we're just a little bit overexposed to each other's brains yeah. and each other's takes. I and like so. the like the Caleb Caitlin Clark stuff and how that's caused divides on whether she's the GOAT or not. And, you know, Black women feeling like their favorite players are being overshadowed by what Caitlin Clark has accomplished and the media coverage around that. 
it's just, man, I just want to watch some basketball sometimes. I just want to watch some I football said it. sometimes. That's why I said I feel like it says more about the, the commenter than it does about the topic because, like, and I don't begrudge any black women who've been in college basketball all this time. I understand how you could react the way that you react, but it's more about all the context surrounded it than it is about what's happening with Caitlin Clark. And it's the same thing with you brought up the Caleb Williams fingernails. It's like anybody who's really up in arms about Caleb Williams fingernails, you upset about you losing your country or your masculinity <laughs> is in danger or or the way that people are dressing you can't keep up with. You miss the bag. Like it's more about you than it is anything else because a man painting his fingernails and having a pink phone case is not affecting your life. You just feel this as an opportunity to yell about something else. And that's why you said like a proxy fight. It's like you're really upset about something different. And I'm saying it like I'm judging mental on high but I've caught myself doing that in the past too where it's like I'm yelling about something and mine is always race related I'm yelling yeah. about something that's semi race related and turn it into some big whole thing while I'm yelling at y'all about how Lamar Jackson is shouldn't have been drafted number 32 I'm actually thinking about something else the history of racism in this so, country it's like, yeah. I don't really give that much of a that Lamar Jackson slid to the end of the draft no, it's just it's a vehicle to, to get you to look at something that actually actually matters. Um, let's gear let's gear towards something that that doesn't matter at all, really. Uh, this I, I I've been I've been needing to talk about this Kendrick J Cole stuff yeah. on this podcast with anybody um, because I I just can't believe he apologized, you know, like on stage at the Dreamfield Vest, like you your fans paid money, hundreds of dollars, some thousands of dollars to come see you apologize for like a half-hearted diss track. I, I, I don't understand how we got here. Like the, 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 the Mark Jackson meme where it's like, what happened to the game I love? Like I yeah. felt like I was having one of those moments when I saw that clip coming across my timeline. Yeah. And again, it's the same thing. People are getting really upset about this. Like, I understand the disappointment. Yeah. I was disappointed too. But you mad about something else if this really got you pissed <laughs> off. Like, because it don't really got me pissed off like that. I, don't, I mean, I, I was annoyed trying to figure too. out what I'm I mean, mad at then. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> like, you don't seem that upset. But like, no. I was like, damn, that sucks. But like, you're not really losing no sleep over these people paying their money to go to the Dreamville Festival. You're not actually upset for them being yeah. robbed. You don't actually care it just no. like to me at least i get the the reasons why people because like hip-hop is different from other art forms and like we get into the history of it and like the essence of it is about braggadociousness and about being better than the next guy and like that's different than other art forms and this one is developing and maturing in a way that is making some people uncomfortable and unhappy it's different for me too i would much rather have a battle continue to go on but if that's what was all this heart, that was, was all this heart, as he said. Yeah. And also, yeah. I would say this is the last thing. J. Cole got to be the most short-sighted, <laughs> smart, fake smart. I know, Fake man. smart. Fake smart. Yeah. Sure. Because, like, he put out the diss track that was subpar and he knew was subpar. But I was like, all right, he just throwing a warning shot. Okay, I get it. He said it in the song. And then he got the reaction of this ain't good. And then his reaction was, apologize like that's gonna stop it you just <laughs> you have just opened yourself up to be dissed by everybody in music all <laughs> other rappers from now on at least for the next six months all people gonna be doing is roasting j cole for it's gonna be in a lot of songs like I, oh, i'm yeah. waiting for push your t to get on the mic it's gonna happen it's open season it's open yeah. season for right and so now. that's why i mean it's just short-sighted like you did you did not end the beef you started 15. It's just, it's funny because now I'm examining, like, I I want J. Cole to feel differently than he does, which is such like, an unreasonable thing to ask. Like, when you, <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 me, change your, your frame of thought for how I would like for you to respond to this. Don't say uh, sorry. He said, yeah. he said big three. No, big me. You're saying sorry, man, come on. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It, it feels. It just feels like we lost some recipes this weekend. That's how I'm feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not. You're not wrong. I'm not going to defend it, but I also I can't pretend like I care that much. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care that yeah. much. It was funny because then someone someone asked me, it was like, when was the last time you listened to a J. Cole album? I was like, for like 2014 when I was in college. Like, <laughs> so, so like, I'm not even listening to J. Cole like that. I can't even say that. Uh, you not waiting for the fall off? That's not. No, I got I got my little, you know, 18 to 22 year old bops off for J. Cole and I never really went back. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, J. Cole, I love a good J. Cole feature, a J., good J. Cole freestyle. And we're just older, man. So, like, I imagine if I was J. Cole's age or if I was a teenager when J. Cole's music was getting popular, like, I can imagine some of that stuff would have hit home for me. But when we was growing up, that we weren't allowed to have feelings. Like, we was listening to killers man he was listening <laughs> to own version of terrible music like nobody was talking about how they felt dmx had like one song about how he felt and that was after he made 47 songs about being a goddamn dog <laughs> <laughs> okay speaking of being a dog oh what a transition transition, transition. Well, I'm, I'm gonna give myself a pat on the back uh you got to be a dog to get drafted to the nfl which you were and i have to ask you know about your own draft day story because I was I talking to our friend uh, Marshall Newhouse about his draft day experience uh, a couple of years ago, and he told me that he got pumped faked by two different teams. Like some teams called him and said, "Yo, we're about to pick you," and his name never showed up on the on the ticker. Uh, and it happened with two different teams before he was eventually picked up by the third one, like the fourth or the fifth round. I'm going to assume that your draft day story is not as chaotic as that one, because that sounds like absolute torture to me. That's ridiculous. The GM must have left the room and somebody else was trying to force in to pick that like that. That doesn't even make sense. Like I've heard um, teams way before the draft really encourage a guy and tell him they was going to pick him. That makes some sense, even though it's a trash thing to do. It makes some sense because you're like, all right, he's going to tell people and that's going to change the way that other teams behave. But when you're on the clock, <laughs> that's just rude. Right? Um, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or he said, it was like, we're, we're coming up with a couple of picks. We think we're going to take you. Two different teams did that to him. That's terrible. Like, And that's not even... Like the gamesmanship for the post draft, like free agents guys, where you want to hold people on until you find out who you're going to get. So you might lie to a couple guys. Like, that's just rude. But anyway, mine wasn't as chaotic. It was kind of stressful. So we had people over for the draft. And that was back. I'm old. So it was back when day one was rounds one through three. I wouldn't have had people over if day one was just round round one. Like, I knew better. And we had a, <laughs> a loaded cornerback draft, too. Like, it was um, Antra Roll and Pac-Man. Who was it? Bartell, I think. There was a bunch of guys who were at the top of the draft at cornerback. So, all right, it just happened to come out on a bad year, but it's going to be fine. I am still know I'm going to go somewhere around two. Round two comes and goes, and I'm still waiting. And I got a house full of people, and we all – walking around, like having conversations, pretending like we're not watching the draft and we're not nervous. <laughs> and as you know, there's 32 teams in the draft. So we come up on 96. It ain't me. But we got compensatory picks, baby. Your man was picking up from a 97, and I was happy as hell because we were, the, the Broncos pulled me out there. I was the third cornerback they drafted. Already. Like, this is uh -huh. the third round. They drafted two cornerbacks already. They drafted me. Um, it's because Peyton Manning was giving them the blues. So they were like, hey, we just going we just gonna spam this position and we gonna find us a player or two out of there. And that's what ended up happening. So that was the draft day story. I was nervous as hell. Walk around in my little stupid clothes, not thinking I wasn't gonna get drafted in front of my friends and family. Now i I've, I've always thought like, you know, when you you get to day two and they're kind of going to broadcasts of different draft parties and stuff like that. Like, man, imagine being the guy who's asking his buddies to come back on Saturday. Like, I don't... Yeah, I couldn't do it. <laughs> but, yeah, I, don't, I couldn't do it. I, I think mean, Richard Sherman told friends, me a story similar to that where he was in Vegas and he was in Vegas and it was kind of a situation where he had the people at, in like a suite or something and it, it ain't work out on day one. So they had to, they had to come back on day two. Worked out for him, though, in the long run. Yeah, yeah, everything turned out okay for him. But, you know, even, like, the, the green room guys, like, I get why people will turn that 
turn that down. Like, I'm, unless yeah. I know I'm going top 15, I don't think I would go to the Green yeah, Room. What I look like at pick 32 and I'm still sitting there. It's a gamble because it's got to be really cool to walk out on stage and give Roger some awkward dap and a hug. Like, that's got to be fun. But also, be real bad if you go back to the hotel and you ain't got no cap. Don't take your ass back to the hotel without no cap. Somebody go give me a hat. I just can't imagine. You know, every time I think about Marshall's story, like, man, two teams. I'd be like, man, I don't even know if I want to play in the NFL anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Got to play with yeah, my tall. emotions. He's tall. He should have worked on his post moves. He got to holler at the NBA draft. Uh, uh, so I do want to get to, you know, the actual NFL draft that's coming up in a couple weeks. There's, I, you know, I feel like there's a handful of teams that kind of own the, you know, the early portion of the draft where depending on whether they want to move up or down, uh, they can go and make a trade for a quarterback and move down for other players, what have you. And I've kind of pulled out four teams you know, I kind of just want to ask you, should they make a trade or should they not make a trade? Vikings, Chargers, Bills, and Broncos, uh, you know, have all been rumored for trades for different reasons over the past, uh, you know, couple months or past couple of weeks in the case of the Bills. So uh, let's start off with the Bills. The Bills have traded Stefan Diggs to Texans for, I don't even know if they got any picks this year. I think it's mostly just picks for 2025. Leaving them with a wide receiver room where Khalil Shakir, who has 700 career receiving yards and three career uh, touchdowns, is like kind of unquestionably the best wide receiver on their team. And I know like they're in a transition year, but you still have Josh Allen, so you should still kind of be gunning for it a little bit and trying to make the playoffs and trying to do some stuff. Should 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 the Bills make like their Julio Jones trade? If Marvin Harrison falls to five or something like that, or if Romo Dunes or Malik Neighbors are falling, should they do what the Falcons did in 11 and make that trade? Uh, absolutely not. I think this might be the easiest one <clears throat> of all the questions that you're going to ask me because uh, I think, obviously, the Diggs trade was not as fruitful as the Tyreek Hill trade, but these teams are in the same place where – their first window is closed and they are entering their second window. And this second window involves paying a lot of money to your quarterback, which I will never begrudge. I, I've said this many times. Every time someone says this nonsense about now the quarterback got to carry a heavier, heavier load. No, y'all finally paying him what he deserves. So y'all need to draft well and manage the roster well. Don't put the pressure on him. So I would say that what the Chiefs did was the blueprint, honestly, is – you got to have a lot of picks and draft a lot of players because what you need to do is repeat what you just did with that quarterback on a rookie deal just in another position. Mm -hmm. And the Chiefs did that, like with Sneed, McDuffie, Karloftis. They didn't do much on offense, but they took shots on offense. It just didn't happen to pan out in the way that they wanted to. But that's how you win now. You win now by... Well, you win now the same way you would have won before. It's great players on rookie deals. You got to get them, and you're going to miss on some. So trading away draft picks to climb up to get somebody, to me, is uh, putting all your eggs in one basket. seems short-sighted, short especially when the position where you need help is the deepest position in the draft. Receiver, like, I get it. If you can get Marvin Harrison Jr., then I would have to think about it, but that seems unlikely. If you're moving up for Rome, or somebody like that, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, no, I know people like neighbors almost as much as as Harrison Jr. I ain't one of them people. Not on this podcast. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> I, I, I thought that I was crazy because people were like, they 1A, 1B. So, first of all, 1A, 1B is just one and two. You just gave it right. different, different names, but stop You're being it. being scared. Yeah. <laughs> stop it. Marvin's nasty, and that's, and that's that. Yeah. And I don't even take it as a slight to neighbors. Like, Marvin's just no. that good. Yeah. yeah, I had this argument the other day where I think that, it, and this is the kind of a, a continuation of the same point, is that if you can get a future Hall of Famer on a rookie deal, like I think about Von Miller, I think about J.J. Watt, I think about players like that, Randy Moss, like Randy Moss showed up and they went 15 and one because he showed <laughs> up. Like, there are players who can have that impact. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Marvin Harrison is close to that type of player. I don't see too many more of them in the draft. Yeah, I, 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 I lean towards no here. And I think also partly because the, 
I think even the math on trade ups has changed since the Falcons made that move for Julio because it only it didn't cost them three. It cost them two first round picks plus some you know second and some change, uh, and they look better because the Browns missed on every single pick that they you know got from that haul, including like Brandon Weed and they use a pick to trade up for Trent Richardson too. So uh, that kind of makes it look better in retrospect. But now like we're in a world where you know the Falcons moved up from like twenty six to six for two firsts, but we live in a world where the 49ers moved up from 12 to three for three first round picks. So if you're going to move from 28 up to four or five, you're three first round picks minimum plus, you know, a second round pick, or maybe you, you flip them like Greg Rousseau or something to keep a first no. rounder. I don't no. know. It, the more you talk about, it, I think it, it gets to be a lot. And also the bills, they need, you know, wide receiver is not the only position that they need. Um, Trey white, Micah uh, Hyde, Jordan Poyer, all gone from the secondary. Mm. So they're going to have to re-up there, too. It's uh, it, it's yeah. not as clean, I think, as maybe people want it to be. I actually was, like, surprised by, and I might be alone on this one, but I was surprised at how good their secondary played without a lot of those guys this season. And I'm partial to Christian Benford because yeah. he grew up in my neighborhood and he played really well um, out there. But I, I actually think that... That wouldn't be the first place I would look if I needed help if I was them. But anyway, that's not the question. The question is you trade up. We agree. Two smart brothers. Hell no. That's right. Yeah. And I, I, I just remember, like, after the Falcons, they started making the playoffs after the Julio Jones trade. And, you know, you got Julio, you got Roddy, you got Tony, and you're scoring. But it, the depth on defense was never there where they could actually, you know, hold on to the leads that were coming up. Like, I remember. Cap and Frank Gore just ran right down the field because they had no bodies on defense uh, in a pretty pivotal game for them. So, no, don't trade out Bills. Um, I think the Broncos are probably the most, the second most interesting team on this list, or maybe the most interesting because it's like the question is, are you going to go back to the ATM and pull more picks from the future when you've already spent two first-round picks on Russell Wilson, you already spent a first-round pick and a second-round pick on Sean Payton, You've got the 12th pick, which everyone agrees is not high enough if you're going to go get, you know, your quarterback of the future in this draft. Do you make another trip to go trade more picks so you basically consolidated like five first round, five, five years worth of first round picks into three drafts that will have netted you Russell Wilson gone, Sean Payton. I don't know what's going to happen with him in the next six mm -hmm. months. That's going to be a pretty bad football team. And then a rookie quarterback on a team that's not going to be any good this year. Is that a wise decision from them? <laughs> yeah, I feel like you tainted the jury, man. But yeah. I think you're, you're absolutely right, even though you didn't make an assertion, but you're absolutely right I in the way that you set it up. It's not, it's not, it's not in the cards for them right now. It seems obvious they still got mon dead money on the cap. It seems obvious that they are in a reset mode and the point to tr the point in trading up, I think, is a couple different ways where I think it's smart. I think it's smart if you are a player away from winning a championship, not contending. If you're a contending team and you think that there is one player in the draft that will make you a championship contender, then by all means, trade up. Then the other thing is a day of trade up. If someone's falling and you just like have enough to trade up to do it, then go ahead and do it. This like we need a quarterback, so we got to trade up. That to me feels like backwards thinking. If you are if that if like the 49ers did for Trey Lance, obviously it didn't work out. But that seems justifiable to me. It's not we need a quarterback of the future. It's we're a Super Bowl team. But this is holding us back. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> that makes sense to me. But this other stuff where it's like, we just don't have one, so let's go get one. Nah, I ain't with that. Yeah, and to make things worse for the Broncos, you know, like these these teams that are rebuilding that end up with no assets to start off to rebuild are always interesting to me. But the, the Broncos, they have two top 100 picks, uh, pick 12 and pick 76. Uh, so you don't really have the picks enough. You know, you, don't, you certainly don't have enough picks or, you know, purchasing power this year to get up to three or four. So you're thinking about trading 2025, 2026 to get up there and draft like J.J. McCarthy or... <laughs> yeah, you know, I know like, they say that you should answer all calls, but if I'm the Broncos, uh, yeah, don't even waste your time calling over here. We're not trading. But they still might do it, though, which is what's, what's kind of fascinating to me. Like, you know, how, how many... 
you know, if, if your ownership, I think you, you kind of got to ask yourself, like, how many first round picks are you just going to keep churning through so that you can really get nowhere? Like, you're still behind Patrick Mahomes, even though they did beat them one time last year. Uh, the Chargers got the fifth pick and Jim Harbaugh's in town. I don't know. It's it's just it, it's just kind of baffling that they keep they, that they would want to keep spending unless they feel like their quarterback is really in this draft. And if that hits, I guess you can eat you know two years of not being able to build anything. Yeah, I mean it's too uncertain. Like I, I'm with you if you knew that your guy was in the draft, but that's just that's just hubris because don't none of us really know. Yeah, the bets in this specific draft, I don't know if I would even really entertain the idea of trading. Trading three first round picks for JJ McCarthy or Jaden no. Daniels or no. <laughs> like no. I, I don't no, know. No, it's absurd. No. It's absurd. They need to trade down if anything. From twelve, <laughs> yeah, get some more. Get, <laughs> get some, some more. more. Back get up. some more. Get some more. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, that would be the smart move. Get some. Get some capital. Yeah, and then what are you going to do? You're going to draft. You're going to trade up and draft someone, and then you know you got Cortland Sutton, who's a good piece, but then you don't even have the money to sign anyone else, and you've blown all your picks to. It's a, it's a bad situation. Like that's one yeah. of those situations where I feel like, you know, you could go back to a young a young quarterback's career that didn't work out and say, okay, it maybe not, maybe it would have worked out if he and anywhere but Denver at this certain point in time. Yeah, feels like what happened with with our man Justin Fields, but also he has some issues. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a little column A, little column B there, probably. Yeah. Okay, now we have two teams left, the Vikings and the Chargers. Uh, I think I feel like the Vikings are pretty easy. Like they should definitely trade up if I mean they've already they've already positioned themselves to do that by trading for that second first round pick. What are you gonna do? Like you got Jordan Love, Caleb Williams about to join the division, the Lions are good, and you got Justin Jefferson and Jordan Anson. Yeah, I think of all the teams, like I said, I, I generally am not a trade up to get a quarterback guy, but of all the teams, this is the one that I would like because they have the protection. Uh, when Darisaw is healthy, especially, they have the protection, they have the weapons, they have everything they need set up. They don't have the defenders, though, but they have a coach who has can coach their defense up or has at least proven that he can coach their defense up to some degree. If a team should move up, it should be a team that's ready to receive a quarterback and this of all the teams that need a quarterback this is the one and they have a coach in O'Connell who um, seems to run a quarterback friendly system uh, I think that this is the team that should con- consider it for the right price so, so yeah if any, if you want a yes from me on one of these teams it's going to be the Minnesota Vikings what quarterback do you think is worth trading up for this year? Obviously, that's the thing. Can't, man. can't get Caleb He's... yeah you can't get Caleb you're not going to get any of the top three I don't think because there are teams up there in position that also need quarterbacks. So let's stop. Let's not bullcrap each other. It's JJ. Like JJ is the only one they have a chance of getting unless they can figure out. I don't know. Unless they plan on sending uh, Justin Jefferson packing along with some first round picks. I don't know how you get a quarter, a team that needs a quarterback to pass up on three of the more like highly rated quarterbacks that we've had in recent drafts. So are you, are you not buying the fact that, you know, people say Drake may could fall, not buying it. I'm not, but I mean, we'll see. I I mean, I'm not going to pretend like this. Like I mentioned earlier, you get older and you get smarter. I remember early in my days doing this, I would make all these emphatic, take all these emphatic positions on stuff that I believed. And I even did the work and watched the tape. And then my ass was dead ass wrong. So like, (laughs) it's hard to project. There's so many variables that impact how quarterback performs. Just because he showed that he can read coverages and throw a good pass in college. College, sometimes that'll work out. You end up with a bad coach. You end up with without receivers. You end up with a lot of free time and not know what to do with it. The defenses are more prepared than you're accustomed to. Like it's so hard to project how well these players are going to to play. The one thing I know is if that dude is an athlete, that's gonna help. <laughs> I just know that that is going to help get get an athlete back there, and then sometimes that can buy you some time to figure everything else out. The, the the mock draft emphatic people are like who are so certain that everything they read in the mock draft is like uh this isn't gonna happen this way I was like probably not you know you, you're right but like you don't know which way it's gonna happen either like a, a few weeks ago there was a 
they were yeah, they, we, we me and Nate Tice, we dropped a mock draft and we had Jaden Daniels like going and pick eleven or something like that. And LSU fans were on our ass yeah. on the internet. They're like, you idiot, like Jaden Daniels not gonna follow the top ten. I was like, I think mean, probably not, but like you don't know that. And this is this is this is fake. It's called a mock draft. Like it's literally called mock in the title. Um, but I was like, dude, I remember when Malik Willis was mocked number two overall the week of the draft that year. And he <laughs> barely made it to the top 100. We no one knows anything. That. Yeah. I mean, them caping for Jaden Daniels when he don't even really like you like that is hilarious to me. Hey, yeah. y'all, y'all was second choice. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, you know, I think, I think, you know, getting throats from Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas, if those guys were at another school, he might have gone to that school instead of LSU. I don't know. <laughs> that helps. I don't, I don't get why. Well, I mean, I guess I do get it. They feel connected to him in some way, but yeah, he don't care about y'all. Relax. Yeah. Uh, Getting back to you know kind of the draft day sliding doors thing, where we're discussing where teams should go in the draft. The Chargers at five have a pretty interesting decision to make. And the more I think about it, I kind of think any decision they make would be valid. And that's really because this is not a very good football team right now. You know, I, I think um, to a degree we're probably getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because. You, know, you you have the quarterback, Justin Herbert. You have Jim Harbaugh, who's had success at every stop he's been at, including the NFL. So it makes you kind of want to say, oh, we'll just hop right back into the playoffs and be in a playoff-relevant team. And then you kind of look at the roster and be like, eh, Justin Herbert being out last year is not the only reason why this team struggled to get across the finish line and win some of these games. So when you start looking at, at their room in the 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 depth chart. Obviously, wide receiver sticks out as a huge need. Um, one, because Quentin Johnson struggled last year, and obviously Keenan Allen is gone. Mike Williams is gone. Uh, and those are two huge guys to replace, especially Keenan Allen in terms of target vacuum. Go to offensive line. They've got some guys on the left side with Rashawn Slater and Zion Johnson. Right side, not so much. Trey Pipkins is probably something that you could be upgraded from. So I think even if they were to take a tackle, it would be valid. Which, to me, like, maybe you should just think about trading down if you get that offer. The mantra of this year's draft is it's a wide receiver deep draft. And if that's a position that you need, they can afford to move back. However, I do appreciate when you have a quarterback like they have, getting uh, as talented a receiver as you can uh, would help them out a great deal. So I I think you're right. There's an argument for either way. But I also think that every player in the NFL, and this is, probably partially my bias as a non-star former player so they're all good like mm-hmm. and you get a good coach in there that understands how to get the best out of each player and put them in position to do the right things i think this team could be even though they aren't super talented they could be better faster than we think and i, I look forward to see what uh jim harbaugh's weird ass does there yeah <laughs> His weird ass. Yeah. I mean, he is weird, isn't he? Man? He's just different. Yeah, I, I remember like when we were, when I was younger, like stories of him like sleeping over at a kicker's prospect's house and asking parents for like steak and milk. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> milk, it's unusual like, character. Yeah, very unusual. Uh, I mean, if football um, didn't exist, if he didn't have sports, who knows where that weirdo would be? Yeah, but he's Beautiful. perfect. I mean, he was born for football. It's, it's good that he's contained the football probably too. Yeah. Wow. Very, 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 very good. Yeah. Oh man. But his, his quote about offensive tackle play at the owners meetings where he was saying, you know, basically this is the one position group on offense that kind of runs itself. Uh, and everyone else's success is kind of based off of that. It kind of made me think, is he going to take a tackle at five much to the chagrin? Like, okay, if Marv zero at five, I think you you sprint, you don't consider anything else and take yeah, Marv. of course not. But, right. you know, if, if he goes at four to the Arizona, you're sitting there with a decision at five. I don't think taking a tackle is really the worst thing in the world. And also, this is a guy who got to the Super Bowl with Anquan Bolden, late career Anquan Bolden, and the corpse of Randy Moss as two of his four healthy wide receivers in a Super Bowl. So I don't know if he really even views this as like a huge need for the kind of football he wants to play. That's fair. I mean, if we look at the success that he had in college most recently, it certainly shows the type of game that he wants to play. But when you have a quarterback like he has, 
And we've all, and not that he listens to this, but we've all been just like waiting for somebody to be able to run fast and catch deep passes from this strong arm quarterback. So uh, I don't think that he cares much about positional value, but I do think that he does a great job of surrounding himself with people who do understand these things. And while attack tackle is a high value position, I think he could certainly stray back if um, neighbors or Marv is there, somebody will give him a couple picks to go back and he can get some more. But yeah, I, I think, yeah, you're right. This is a team that's in a good spot, which I guess means they need a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so like, I wouldn't yeah. be mad at just about anything that they do unless they just get terrible value for the trade. Yeah. Um, for what it's worth, our friend Charles Robinson, uh, who covers the NFL here, said that uh, a bunch of executives that he talked to thinks that Harbaugh's throwing smoke out there with the tackle stuff and uh, that they think he's bluffing about offensive line. Yeah. But, I mean, that'd be pretty foolish if he just was like, hey, you know what? I love tackles. And then went and drafted a tackle. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what they'll get about some of these games sometimes. I'm like, God, who wants to draft a tackle? You can draft a tackle. I don't know. And, like, <laughs> you're, and, and when you're that high up in the draft, yeah. yeah, ain't too many people pick it before you. You don't need a quarterback, yeah. so I don't know. I, yeah. I think sometimes we overthink. You know, they overthink some of the games that they're actually being played with the you know the bluffing back and forth. Uh, but we have, uh, or we're going to do you know a bunch of question and answers after that break, and we have a quick one before we uh, we get into that. This is from Connor Leahy one zero one five. Which team that's been rumored to trade down at any point in the first round? will be making the biggest mistake in doing it. I think I might go with Arizona here. Like if you've if you've committed to the Kyler thing, just take Marvin, assuming the top three picks are quarterback, which is what it seems like it's going to be, unless unless New England kind of says, eh, you know, the quarterback we really want to win at two, we'll just take Marv at three. Um, which is not a bad plan. I don't, you know, he's the best player in the draft. It's never a bad idea to add the best player in the draft. But um, for me, I think I would go with Arizona for that one, just because uh, now that Hollywood's in K- in Kansas City, it's not really a whole lot outside of like Trey McBride in Arizona. So just, yeah. just take Marvin. I mean, I, I I made the exact same point on Get Up a couple weeks ago, and um, the pushback I received was they have a lot of problems, and that's where I pull, pulled out my take about Hall of Fame players on rookie deals. Like, chill out. And everyone they and they said the old the old refrain is like, but it's a lot of receivers in this draft. Yeah, they are, but there's only one Marvin Harrison Jr. in this draft. And y'all seen him play? Why are you acting like he he like them? Stop acting like he's normal. And man, of course, a bunch of things can can go wrong and everything can happen, but don't outsmart yourself. And this was a uh, Mike Tannenbaum. He was out here over GMing. Don't over GM. Mm-hmm. Relax. It's like you trying to trade this, get some value. No. There is a future Hall of Famer looking you in your eyes, drafted. <laughs> well, because I I remember when um when the lost my train of thought. Oh no no when the when the twenty eleven draft was coming along. Uh, you know that's that's the year the Panthers drafted Cam Newton, and mm. the year before that they were they had drafted Jimmy Clausen from Notre Dame, who was woo buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, <laughs> sometimes like you, 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 sometimes you just see someone play one game, you know they ain't got it, and like that's kind of where Jimmy was. But you know, I, yeah, by I, I got a bunch of friends in Charlotte, and I remember before the draft, I was like, man, you know, I think they they should take Von Miller and you know ride this out with with Jimmy and give him a chance. I'm like, yo, Cam Newton, Cam Newton is right there. And you're yeah. gonna take you're gonna let Jimmy Clausen take another stop for your football team, bro? I don't I don't know about all that. Yeah, that seems pretty um, obvious. Yeah, it's just funny to me like where people kind of talk themselves into like, no, you've got a, a Hall of Fame caliber player or all pro caliber player right there. Just take them. Don't overthink it. Jimmy Clausen, someone like that should never stop you from doing anything. And with that, we'll be right back with a word from our sponsors. Okay, mailbag time. You ready? Ready to crank through these? Let's do it. All right. The first one from at JV3. Uh, a lot of great defensive backs are found on day three of the draft. Are there any particular skill sets or traits you look for to find guys that could break through? 
I wish I had the answer to that, but I'm still mad at Jeff Okuda for making me feel so dumb because I watched him and he's a first day guy. And I was like, hey, this might be the best corner prospect I ever seen the way that he played uh, against top level receivers in college. And it didn't pan out. I think cornerback is probably one of the hardest positions to project because it, it, it's so much more. Uh, there's like an elite level of physical ability that you need to be able to cover someone and then you combine that with the intelligence I think that you need uh, to play the position it's hard to find and then the systems what you ask of different players is different in different places it's a real hard position to project so I think the best thing you can do is try to find players that have the skill set that best suits the system that you're running obviously late in the draft and get a bunch of them and hope some of them stick yeah, I think I think like the Rams have had a pretty interesting strategy over the past few years in the draft where obviously like they've spent so many first round picks on the stars, but they have just acquired so many day three picks. Yeah. Like I think I think last year they had like nine or ten picks between like rounds five through seven, which is like dart throw, dart throw, dart throw. And a few of them work out. You know, sometimes you find a Kyron Williams, you find a Kobe Turner, you find Puka Nakua. Um, so you know, I I, I think, you know, even just the the idea that like really embracing that this is these are dart throws. You know, we're rolling the dice on every single pick that we make. We might as well just get as many as we possibly can. This one from Roscoe. How good do you think teams are at actually projecting the positions depth a year out in the draft? Hear rumblings every year of team needing to get a blank because next year's class is bad. But it seems like mostly everyone sucks at predicting that. And I, I this is something I wanted to bring up with the Broncos because I think you could look at the Broncos. If you're the Broncos, you could look at next year's quarterback class with a bit of alarm and say, hey, you know, what what's what's really out there for us if we don't get someone this year? But yeah, you, you never quite know, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you never know, but I think making those decisions based on, uh, like, this ain't the NBA, guys. Like, I get it if it's Victor Wimbanyama, but, like, this is a, a, a very, I think, I guess short of baseball, baseball is a very individual team sport. Basketball also feels like it can be controlled by an individual because they're on both sides of the floor and they get to hold the ball. They play offense and defense. Football is on the entire different side of the spectrum because like you can see a bunch of basketball players together and like recognize that they're basketball players, but it's not like that for football players because the jobs are so different. So, and they're so interdependent and so dependent on each other. I think angling for one player or one position in one class to me seems like a misunderstanding of the complexity of the game. So unless there's somebody, one special person, and we thought it was Trevor Lawrence and you see that ain't quite happened the way that it was supposed to happen yet. Nobody Not said yet. that I about CJ Stroud and it worked out. So like, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> we right. don't really know. No, no one, no one actually knows. Let's see this one from uh, Matt underscore sports. Not what in the F did Drake may do to be the only top quarterback in this class who's being nitpicked nationally by anonymous execs and scouts. <laughs> you got to ask these anonymous I'll execs say, and scouts. I don't, like, I, don't I, don't, I don't know what he did. Uh, I, I'm with you. I'm surprised by it also. Um, it, it's. Yeah, we've come uh, a long way we've come a long yeah, way that, <laughs> you, were, you, you made you made the point i was trying to figure out how to make also like yeah i'm shocked just like you man is six five two thirty and white with a, a rocket arm and run. With a rocket <laughs> and some athleticism and you throw left-handed touchdowns i don't know i'm confused <laughs> i'm just as confused as y'all <laughs> you know i i it's like i don't i'm ha i'm i'm happy that you know some of our, our fellow brethren are not getting nitpicked as much as they used to, but it's like, y'all ain't got no questions about Jaden Daniels? None? <laughs> I got some. <laughs> I got some I ain't going to ask them too loud, but I got some. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm going to text so, them to you after we no longer record. <laughs> <laughs> you you didn't have uh, the, the 4 4 from Michael yeah. Penix. It's all you need to see, and you're just <laughs> top five pick? Yeah. Okay. But I yeah, just wish I, we didn't have to get to a place where we had to do it to somebody. Right. Like, it just, right. Yeah. We don't have to do it to anybody. You can just talk about these guys and, and how they perform. But with Drake, I I don't know. I don't know what happened with him. The next question is from at Wizard Amphibian. Uh, who is the funniest option to trade up the house for a quarterback? 
like the most impractical team that would throw their future at Jaden Daniels for pick number three? Um, <laughs> and my answer is in the Saints, for sure. Yeah. That's a good one, I feel like. I mean, I, I, I like the Saints. It'd just be fun because they treat the salary cap very differently than everyone else. And they run their team very differently than everyone else. It hasn't led to Super Bowls, but it's more success than you would expect for uh, a team that is trying to do things so differently. Yeah, that would be pretty fun. I mean, I, I think it's, I guess the 49ers seems crazy, but just them doing it again makes me laugh. But I, I guess our guy balled in the playoffs a uh, kind of like he played well enough. I think that a funny one would be to give another test to our toughest soldier, Mike Tomlin, <laughs> and say, okay, Mike, you know, you, you survived Big Ben, you survived Le'Veon, you survived Antonio uh, Brown, whatever you guys were holding on the wraps there until he exploded when when he left. Now, here's Russell Wilson, who you have said is going to start. Justin Fields, who might be the best quarterback on your roster right now, based on what we saw last year. Now go trade up and get Jaden Daniels number three and deal with all of the egos and the draft <laughs> allocations and just the infighting that will go on in that very, very, oh, God. <laughs> you know, in- interesting quarterback room. Uh, very, very black quarterback room. <laughs> I mean, I- that's once you have one black as one black quarterback, then you have to have all black quarterbacks, as we oh, learned. B- and- Bomani's point on that is so funny. It's true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. It's a, it's not a coincidence. No, that's, not. that's the biggest evidence that I think that my hometown Washington Commanders are going to draft Jane Daniels because they went and got a brown quarterback. <laughs> yeah, it like, that's what left in the market. Yeah, it's like let's go get Mariota because that'll be okay. It'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> when, when Jameis signed in Cleveland, man, I was cracking up. <laughs> like, come on. Baltimore come on. went the extra mile. They got a black coach <laughs> and three black quarterbacks. <laughs> I, mm. Didn't Tyler Huntley sign in Cleveland too? Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh, man. But <laughs> God damn, that's funny. Yeah. Where did Jacoby Brissett sign? Uh, he's in New England. Uh-oh, uh, it's a fight for Jaden. <laughs> a Jaden off. They having a Jaden off right now. <laughs> or maybe maybe the Patriots they they get back to the first round and draft Penix. Uh, so you get Penix oh, super Maybe, set, maybe you know? that's it. Yeah, they gotta <laughs> trade back and get Michael no, Penix. Oh no, but I, I think the thing is yeah. you you can have a black backup. If you have a white starter, you can't have a white backup with the black starter. That's the tough thing. Yeah. So yeah, because the, the the Joe Flacco wars got a little hot last year. You know. Oh hey. yeah. I mean, is how absurd is it that they didn't re-sign Joe Flacco? They didn't re-sign Joe Flacco for one reason, because they can't have them three interceptions in a playoff game sitting behind, uh, behind Deshaun because he Deshaun throw one pick. The yeah. Flacco chance is coming. <laughs> It was funny because my my buddy Justice he has like a little bit that he was doing after, you know, have the Browns like they had a great season. They let go a bunch of coaches that positions that were performing well, like running back and tight end. And he was like, "You saw the Flacco, right? Those were the believers. You had to root out the non-believers because you can't have people who <laughs> were in sense. the building saying, hey, maybe yeah. maybe this yeah. Flacco thing something we should Y'all try gotta out.' Go. Y'all gotta go." <laughs> Because look, uh, if you just look at performance, you can make the argument easy. that Joe Flacco should have been their quarterback this year, too. Easy. Oh, man. Uh, uh, next question from Retired Trapper. Uh, most mock draft analysis have Cooper DeJean as a safety. Where is he most likely to get a chance to prove himself at corner? I uh, refuse to accept them moving my man Cooper from corner no, to safety. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. <sighs> If he can he can yeah. play corner. He's good at it. Yeah, yeah, and it's a really tough position to find people to play corner at. And uh, I know he's not like a man coverage corner, but he might be. They just don't run a bunch of man coverage in Iowa. He might be, but either way, he's a great cover three corner. Like I don't, I don't get it. I, I appreciate positional flexibility in the secondary is hugely valuable now. So move him around, cool. But I think he's a corner to start with. Yeah, uh, anywhere where they are open minded. And as far as like scheme, I don't know. Gus Bradley, just yeah. stick him on one side of the field and kind of forget about it. I don't know. I think he's, 
I think it's really good. Like all the stuff saying he has to move to safety, it just feels a little racist. <laughs> <laughs> it's very racist. It's very racist. Like he comps to to a, a lot of great corners. It's like his athleticism. Like, come on, guys, let's stop it. Dude, yeah, like you know, big corner that can run and jump out the gym. Let's not overthink this. Yeah, the man returns punch. He's yeah. not like he's not stiff. The guy yeah. can play corner. If he don't want to play corner, that's fine. But don't y'all yeah, force that's that totally man different. to play safety. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a totally different conversation. If he don't oh. want to be a pioneer, that's on him. I get it. Not everybody is, is built to Rosa Parks that position. He he should give it a shot for the yeah. money. It's I not mean anything else. I, I, I follow him on Instagram and I see the music that he puts his highlights to. That man's a goddamn corner. <laughs> Have you ever seen his high school uh, hoops tape? Oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah. I've been God. I've been on that. I've been on that for a long time. It's incredible. Yeah. Cause well, high school is interesting because like that's one of the spots where you can like where you really start to see, okay, some of these guys are just built different than yeah. the rest of you, a lot better just gonna be going to algebra. Uh, but like his, <laughs> some of the dunks that he's got on that highlight tape, he's like 15 and his head is like hovering next to the rim. I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. That's a corner. That's a cornerback right there. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. One of the last questions from at Joe B's need Fox to share a locker room story from the 2008 Atlanta Falcons. Yeah. The problem is the best locker room story is can't be shared so like it just yeah it can't be shared I, I and that was a, a weird year for me because I got traded there on week one and it was my contract year so it was a real stressful year and I ain't really have too many relationships there but uh we the one thing that that uh coming off of the Cooper DeGene athleticism conversation this is not really a in the locker room story but Brent Grimes was a cornerback there and he had some of the most absurd athleticism that you had ever seen. And this, I could think of a couple of times where, you know, we use trash cans to like simulate offensive linemen or something or whatever to do drills around. So there's like these big gray trash cans and you stack them all the way up to like about, uh, before you unstack them to set them up, they're just outside stacked up and they go up to like my shoulder or like my ear. Brent just comes out. We're all walking out to practice. And the thing about Brent that was like shocking wasn't how amazingly athletic he was. It was how amazingly athletic he was at all times. So mm -hmm. we're all walking out to warm up and he just jumps over him. And we're like, what? <laughs> we, had, we just got on the field. He just jumps over him. And there was another time we were in Minnesota, I think, or somewhere in the Midwest playing a game. And, you know, we land and we all go to the mall or something to get some food or go somewhere. So we're in the mall. And you remember how Bo Jackson uh, in that baseball game ran on the wall? Oh, yeah. And it's not just a combination of his athleticism. It's a combination of athleticism and, like, impulse control, I guess. Because we walking in the mall and we all just walking like normal dudes in the mall. And Brent just starts running on the wall. <laughs> like we're in the mall and like I'm too impressed to be like embarrassed by the fact that I'm with a dude running on the wall. It's like Spider-Man. Yeah, he just, that's it. He was just like Spider-Man all the time. It's a ridiculous athleticism. You know, there's a old podcast. Yeah, I referenced my friend just before. We had a podcast way back in the day where we had no technology. We were just sitting from a laptop called Set in the Edge, and we interviewed Miko. <laughs> we interviewed Miko for an episode, and, you know, I, I, we didn't have any equipment. I didn't know how to edit anything. Like, I would just upload everything unedited. And that was one where I was like, man, if I press upload on this and I share this <laughs> out, <laughs> I can't get that back. <laughs> now, I still did press it, but, yeah. you know, we've talked to a bunch on the show about getting older and getting smarter. There were some things on that set on that podcast that maybe shouldn't have seen the light of day, but <laughs> it it did, and you know, no one really got in trouble, and people thought good. it was funny mostly mostly because our good. our platforms were much much smaller than they were uh, than they are now. But yeah, Miko, woof, yeah, my she's, eyebrows she's, were singed after that podcast was over. She's different, <laughs> different for sure. <laughs> uh, all right, one more question. Uh, this is from Josh Ray A. Um, who's your safety one? Best safety that you've seen from this year's class? Ed Reed, stop it. I said in this year's class. Oh, the draft, the draft. Oh, the draft. I'm sorry. 
I don't know. Nobody care about no safety. Oh no, Cooper <laughs> DeGene. That's my my, <laughs> my safety one. Is uh, Cooper DeGene. I love uh, him at quarterback and safety. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's probably the right answer. There's not too many guys this year. College football has taken away our linebackers and our safety prospects. Yeah, I don't, I don't get because dude, if you think back, the last real like bona fide linebacker prospect was Roquan, and he's on his second deal. You know? Yeah. He's getting up you, there. I mean, I guess you wouldn't consider Micah Parsons that. Well, I always thought he was an edge, like even yeah. at, at at Penn State. I was yeah. like, man, just don't don't make him think. Just let him cut him up the field. And yeah. So I never really thought about the linebacker prospect like that. Yeah, the game is devalued. All of both of those very very, and it seems like they're those positions are getting more important in the NFL. Uh, uh, like every year, it seems like it's became becoming more important, and offenses are picking on them and running schemes to attack them specifically. But yeah, yeah. But just to answer this question, I'll give out. I think Malik Mustafa from Wake Forest is pretty good. Um, you know, that we don't know. We don't know. No, I mean, okay. I don't. I don't know if he's going to be good, but I've yeah. seen him run yeah. full speed with no fear through an alley enough times to say, "Hey, maybe this can work out." I don't know. I've uh, always that's that's one of my favorite plays in football when the safeties line uh, up one on one and just kills them. Yeah, that's a, a hugely fun play to watch, but. I don't know how relevant it is in no, <laughs> the not, modern it's NFL. Not like, are, are you going to no. be a great support player? Oh, yeah. Just go ahead. Are you going to tackle him for a three yard gain or a four yeah, yard like, gain? He's like a fourth round pick. And that's, that's, oh, what okay. this, that's, fair. Yeah, that's what this safety class is, is kind of giving you. All right. Um, uh, before we get out of here, anything you want to let people know about? Yeah. Come working on? Check out my podcast, Dominique Fox of Show. It's fun and informative and beautifully shot. Check it out. It's on all the podcast places and YouTube. Really sold the hell out of that. <laughs> I mean, I, I ain't much. I ain't much of a beggar. What are you telling me? Yeah. Like, you can go look at Charlie Kravitz if. Uh, oh if yeah, the snack. The, the, yeah, the snack. Uh, all right, so that's gonna do it for this episode of the Exact List. Uh, Jason Fitz, Charles Robson, Joy Epstein will be back on Thursday with an episode of Inside Coverage. Uh, we'll be back on Monday next week. It's a little change in the schedule, talking all things All Juice team with uh, Charles Robinson. So be on the lookout for that podcast. Put a lot of work into selecting uh, the 23 players in this year's All Juice team in honor of our, our late colleague and friend, Therese Paler. Uh, I'm Charles McDonald. You can find me on Twitter at 4 Verts. You can find Dominique on Twitter at Foxworth24, our producer behind the glass stone. You can find him on Twitter at SJ Rochelle. And we will see you next week on Monday.